Okay, good morning everybody in person and online. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce Sandra Hassing, uh, who's been a strong advocate of childhood obesity. The organizers of the Grand Rounds wanted to, to end 2023 with a big bang, and they couldn't have chosen a better speaker. I typically don't read when I introduce individuals. However, today I'm going to break that silver rule because I'm afraid if I don't read, I will miss important aspects of Sandra's career. Sandra has devoted her professional career caring and ad advocating for children with obesity and is the current medical director of the AAP Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight, which is focused on translating research into practice for pediatric healthcare providers, families, and children, and advancing the field of pediatric obesity. Dr. Hassing has testified before Congress, not an easy task to do, on childhood obesity, food insecurity, and hunger focusing on supporting the foundation of childcare. She was the vice chair of the writing committee for the 2023 AAP clinical practice guidelines and elephant pregnancy, sorry Nancy, both in length and in labor. Uh, for the evaluation and treatment of obesity in children and adolescents. She is past board member and past president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Hassing began the weight management clinic at Lumer's Dupont Children's Hospital in 1988 when people thought, what's obesity? She has collaborated in basic research efforts to identify pathophysiologic mechanisms of obesity, centering on the role of leptin and has lectured widely in the field of pediatric obesity. In addition, she has authored a parent's guide to childhood obesity, pediatric obesity, prevention, intervention, and treatment strategy for primary care and clinical guide to pediatric weight management. Dr. Hassing also holds a master of science in, guess what? Pastoral care and counseling. She's right now, working towards a PhD in theology. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. I'm extraordinarily pleased to be with you today to talk about the new guidelines. And as you heard, I served as the vice chair of uh, the evaluation and treatment uh, writing committee, and I'm the medical director of the AP Institute on Healthy Childhood Weight. Today, I'm gonna to give you a little bit of background on the guidelines, what, uh, what's new and what went into the guidelines and then go over the guidelines with you. Hopefully we'll have some time for questions, both in person and online. As Silva alluded to, it was a long gestational process. It was a five-year process to write these guidelines. Uh, before uh, beginning writing, we had to uh, petition the AAP to put this topic of obesity in their guideline development process. It's our highest uh, evidence-based process at the academy. Uh, we wrote uh, in, the, in the process of this two technical reports. We then convened the writing committee. We uh, reviewed the key action statements. We did another evidence review and then published the guidelines in January of this year. Uh, we started, it's been 15 years before the guidelines since the last comprehensive guidance. And we started with 16,000 abstracts and boiled that down to uh, 13 key action statements, 11 consensus recommendations, and two technical reports, and then the final CPG report. The key questions that we were addressing were, what are the clinic-based effective treatments for obesity? Now, remember, this is a treatment guideline. Uh, we did not... Uh, we. Uh, intended to address prevention, but there were no prevention studies that met the evidence bar for this guideline review. And then we wanted to ask the question, what is the risk of comorbidities among children with obesity? So I'm gonna go over some things that are new from the previous recommendations. And the purpose of this is to give you some background for where we are now with obesity. And I think the first thing we understand more fully is that obesity is a complex chronic disease. And this provides us with an opportunity to change the conversation about obesity with our patients, our colleagues, our students in the media, with payers and in policy discussions. So I'm arming you for this discussion. 
Now, when we traditionally look at obesity, we sort of look at the individual factors, the socioecological factors, you see them all there, influences on energy intake, influences on, we don't know, energy in, uh, intake and decreased energy, uh, and influences on decreased energy. And that's sort of the traditional mindset when you begin a conversation and you isolate risk factors and you, you sort of target your conversation around that. But I'm going to suggest that now we're in, a, we have a different way of talking about obesity. So the Obesity Medicine Association defines obesity as a chronic relapsing multifactorial neurobehavioral disease, where an increase in body fat promotes adipose tissue dysfunction and abnormal fat mass physical forces, resulting in adverse metabolic, biomechanical, and psychosocial health consequences. This is a lot different then it's just excess adipose tissue, right? The AP uh, definition is obesity is a chronic disease that results in altered anatomy, physiology, and metabolism, all of which adversely affect the physical and mental health trajectory of children and adolescents. So I wanna put you in this universe for a minute and look at the complexity of obesity. Uh, we know that it's in some ways, people have said this is a brain-based disease in many senses. We have cognitive input from environmental and lifestyle made up of sensory input, cues and habits, marketing, food availability and cost, reward, reward uh, uh, modeling and modeling and meal timing. And we have input from our bodies that are, our body is constantly sensing our energy status, giving feedback. And all of this goes into regulating, fine tuning our, uh, our energy regulation system and our adipose tissue reserves. So when we look at reframing obesity, this isn't just an academic exercise. This is going to help your patients remove the blame and guilt about sort of it's their fault they have obesity. This is a complex, complex pathophysiology. The brain monitors the body's internal energy status through hormonal and neuro, neural nutrient sensing mechanisms. The brain's under a constant barrage of the environmental and lifestyle, sensory, cognitive, and emotional input. The streams of information are integrated to generate adaptive behavioral and uh, autonomic endocrine responses, determining nutrient partitioning, energy expenditure, and overall energy balance. So we have environmental stimuli, body responses, and any of the peripheral and central signaling steps in this complex system are subject to individual predispositions through either genetic, epigenetic, or non-genetic early life imprinting mechanisms. This is a highly complex disease. And I just put one of our resources there. You can have this slide deck and a lot of resources are here to further flesh this out. We also know that there are factors that influence adipose tissue and development over the uh, pediatric uh, span. So we have intrauterine influences of maternal obesity, gestational diabetes, inadequate nutrition, exposure to environmental toxins, genetic defects, infancy feeding practices, nutrient content of human milk and formula, timing of complementary feeding, shaping of the gut microbiome, child and adolescence, dietary patterns and quality, appetite and eating, gut microbiota, sex hormones, puberty onset. So even in pediatrics, we have uh, this increase in adipose tissue mass mass from birth to adolescence. There's two periods of accelerated adipose tissue accumulation, early childhood and puberty. We have an increase in, in obesity in cell number and cell size. And when you get an increase in cell size and adipose tissue, adipocyte hypertrophy drives macrocyte infiltration and causes an inflammatory uh, infiltration in the adipose tissue. And adipose tissue is not inert. It produces multiple, it has, contains multiple cell types that secrete hundreds of adipokines that regulate key biologic processes. So it is not just excess adiposity, AKA weight. This is an, a, one of the most complex endocrine organs in the body. And you see that all the, the cells that are contained in adipose tissue and all the secretory products therein. What else do we understand? We understand that there's actual physiologic impact of social determinants of health. So obesity is both an indicator of and subject to social determinants of health, like structural inequalities of unjust food systems, health inequality, 
environment, health inequities, environmental and community factors. Um, genetics, obesity promoting environments, life experiences combined with these inequities and structural barriers all contribute. And understanding both the complex physiology and the, the influence of social determinants helps individualize and tailor treatment by providing context for our patients and also helps reduce the blame and guilt. So there is a link between social determinants of health and epigenetics. So epigenetic inheritance is inheritance of traits, gene expression or phenotypes without changes to the underlying DNA sequence. There, these are attached methyl groups or histone uh, groups to the DNA based on life experience, what the person, the body is experiencing. Some epigenetic phenomena are highly responsive to environmental changes. Um, and, excuse me, I just got an emergency alert on that phone. Um, some epigenetic phenomena are, are responsive to environmental changes, such as socioeconomic status. The readout of somebody's epi epigenome who has had a gen uh, lifetime of poor socioeconomic status is different than a person who hasn't. Several epigenetic traits are established early in development and their effects on health unfold throughout the life course. And some epigenetic mechanisms provide semi-stable biologic mechanisms through which features are inherited through generations. That's why obesity is multi-generational. This is another way socio, uh, so, so social determinants can have a physiologic impact. Uh, okay. I said something. Um, they don't wanna talk about social determinants of health, I guess. Um, these social determinants, when you look at a growth chart, and if you've ever looked at a growth chart and you've seen an inflection point in that growth chart, and you've said the kid was doing okay and then suddenly the weight went up. And maybe you asked, what happened when you were five? You might get parents got divorced, father or mother lost a job. You may have gotten a major life stressor and you may have said, well, something obviously changed in that child's life. Something certainly did change, but it wasn't just the environment. These stressors have impact on the brain, the adrenal glands, which then impact adipose tissue, which then cause these, these uh, pathologic changes in adipose tissue, which then result in disease. So this is these we're beginning to understand some of the physiologic links here between what is happening to you and what is happening to your body and what is producing chronic disease. We know that uh, food insecurity screening and screening for social determinants is something that we're all beginning to do. And understanding these determinants um, and in, in which your patient and family have to function allows you to personalize and focus treatment. It's really hard to advocate with your patient for a healthy diet if they just don't have enough food or if all they can worry about is, is where the food is coming from. What else is new? We understand more fully the implications of weight bias and stigma, that it's pervasive, it's harmful, and it can be a barrier to treatment. So we know that we ourselves, our whole culture is uh, per pervaded with weight bias and stigma, including the medical profession. And so we're not gonna go through this today, but we ask all of you, we're asking all pediatricians to understand their own implicit bias in clinical care. Um, just understand it, understand it's in the culture. Once you understand it, you can deal with it and not act on it. Um, the experience of weight bias, stigma, and discrimination has profound effects on somebody experiencing it. They may decrease their exercise and physical activity. It increases social isolation and poor academic and is associated with poor academic outcomes. People uh, experiencing this have more unhealthy eating behaviors, worsening obesity, depression and anxiety, increased cortisol reactivity from the stress response increased self-harm and suicidality, increased risk for chronic disease. So again, this is the internalization of a societal um, prejudice that affects physiology and causes chronic disease. 
We know that obesity is a, a chronic disease with a longitudinal course, and there's no benefit to watchful waiting. This is not likely in our, in our obesogenic environment, something that a child will outgrow. You have to stay the course as in any other chronic disease. And we understand that, and we understand that there are treatment relapses, and treatment may have to vary in intensity and support across the trajectory of this disease. We understand, and this is, we built this into the CPG, that there are facilitators of uh, treatment, that it has to be longitudinal. It relies on relationship and interactivity. It must be family-based, centered in the medical home. You have to see these children frequently. We have to align our expectations with those of our families. We need to be prompt, don't wait, treat as soon as you diagnose. You have to intensify treatment when you diagnose obesity. We need empathic, non-stigmatizing care. We use motivational interviewing to, to both engage, retain, and set goals for our patients. We teach self-management, and we want engagement and participation from our families. We understand that obesity and comorbidities are linked and must be treated concurrently. So you treat, if you have a comorbidity, you must also be treating obesity because that's one of the treatments for the comorbidities. And you can see here that the comorbidities just hit every organ system. We're all familiar with these. And these are what we used to call in the old days, the diseases of adulthood. We never expected to see children with these diseases, but we are. And 8% of our children have severe obesity and children with severe obesity are much more likely to have these comorbidities. So in the guidelines, is a clinical flow chart with assessment and evaluation that runs through how to uh, diagnose and uh, intervene and treat these uh, comorbidities. We also have a, a note there about obesity-related emergencies. We didn't uh, have to talk about obesity-related emergencies in the past, but there are clear emergencies which uh, require urgent attention and people have to now be aware of. There are new from previous recommendations. There are multiple evidence-based strategies that can be used collectively to deliver tailor, intense and tailored obesity treatment. And so we know we now have evidence-based treatment that can be used. And these are um, intense uh, lifestyle, uh, intense health behavior lifestyle treatment, pharmacotherapy and surgery. And so this is sort of the house that uh, we are working with, we need ongoing assessment of our individual social and contextual risk factors and evaluation for comorbidities and comorbidity treatment. We're using MI for shared decision-making and ongoing counseling. We're providing or referring to intense health behavior and lifestyle treatment, and we use pharmacology and surgery as indicated, and we'll be delving into those in a minute. What else is new? Structured supervised weight management interventions decrease current and future eating disorder symptoms. Now, this has been a big concern, um, and we know that the prevalence of eating disorders is not well characterized yet in people participating in obesity treatment, but disordered eating patterns may be more common, and so studies are ongoing. We know that structured and professionally run pediatric obesity treatment is associated with reduced eating disorder prevalence, risk, and symptoms. Therefore, we're asking pediatricians to evaluate all the patients with obesity for eating disorders during, at, before, during, and after uh, intense behavioral interventions and act on those diagnoses if they make them. So the guideline does not recommend restrictive diets. In fact, the structure and underlying principles of the primary care-based intense health behavior and lifestyle programs share multiple similarities with eating disorder programs. Focus on increasing healthful food consumption, participating in physical activity, improving overall self-esteem and self-concept. Um, we are now partnering with our colleagues in the eating disorder community. We have a cross-functional work group coming out of these guidelines to provide education. To uh, We're now developing a screening tool for primary care for disordered eating. Uh, we're going to have a three-webinar series in the, in the uh, upcoming year uh, to talk about screening and the intersectionality of eating disorders and obesity. So 
um, this has actually resulted in a profound collaboration that I think will be very helpful to our children. So I wanted to spend some time now and go over the actual guidelines themselves. And you know, guidelines are evidence-based. We have an evidence grading system. Um, the Academy puts out a number of different statements. We have technical reports, which we have two associated with this that provide background. We have policy statements that are advocacy recommendations, and we have clinical reports that usually are a literature review on some clinical topic, but the highest level of evidence is uh, the clinical practice guidelines. So when you develop a key action statement, you're really looking at what can you say based on the quality of evidence and associated benefits or harms. And then you're making a comment on the level of intended obligation to match the strength of the recommendation. So you will see in these key action statements, the use of the word should. So the words should and may are used in the key action statements are based on the level of associated evidence. They reflect the action that is meant to be taken based on the evidence under what circumstances to take the action and the level of obligation to follow an evidence-based recommendation. The use of should is meant to represent an intermediate level of obligation, not a required action. It's an evidence-based recommendation that allows for some variation based on the circumstances. So this is a different use of should than you might use in, in just common uh, language. As always, clinical decision-making is undertaken in partnership with the patient and family based on a comprehensive evaluation, understanding the components of evidence-based treatment to create an individualized and tailored treatment plan that include longitudinal care. So we are giving you the best evidence we have, and then we're asking you to tailor this to the needs of your family and patient. So each patient and family will have their own desires, responses, and capacity to engage in treatment. Presenting evidence-based treatment allows them to understand their choices and options. So we're, you know, we have evidence, we have a disease, we're gonna offer the patients the options they have, and then we're gonna work with them to make a treatment plan. And there's plenty of help in the guidelines and in our implementation materials to help you do just that. We're asking pediatricians to continue to serve as a medical home and seek this treatment in the medical home to tailor treatment to develop an individualized and, and comprehensive plan and to provide or ensure ongoing medical monitoring. And they may do that in a variety of ways. If they refer to a weight management program, they still are the medical home and keep in touch that way. They may be providing intense health and behavioral lifestyle treatment themselves. They may be referring that out to the community and keeping in touch with the program. There are many ways to do this. This is the CPG algorithm. It's just an example of some of the materials that we have in the CPG to guide uh, treatment. And again, this is uh, a clinical flow and assessment. And I think that uh, the reason I put this one here and highlighted this is that uh, weight has become a has always been a touchy subject. And it is not easy to discuss weight. There's because of all the factors we know are operating in society. And so for a well visit as a pediatrician, you're always asking, what would you like to talk about today? What concerns do you have your, about your child's health? You may share the BMI chart with them and ask permission to discuss the weight, ask permission. If you ask permission, most of the time, the patient's gonna give you a good read on where they are. Patients want to be asked. If they're not ready, they're not ready. You can talk about something else. You can see them back. If they're ready, you've asked permission. And um, patients wanna know why you're asking them about their weight. Um, this is a little different. We assume patients know our good intent. We assume patients know we're interested in their health, but patients feel very judged. And so they kind of come embraced to many visits about their weight. So if you ask, say, I'm very, you know, I'm here to help you with your health. I'm concerned, you know, because of your family history or whatever, can we talk about your weight today? Tell them why you're here. Tell them why you're interested. It, we know it, they don't always know it. So the first part of the guidelines are really about assessment and evaluation. And here we go into the key action statements. So we know we're going to be, re we recommending we measure BMI at least annually for all children two to 18 years of age. 
And the consensus recommendation associated with this is we want to perform an initial and longitudinal assessment of individual structural and contextual risk factors to provide individualized and tailored treatment of the child and adolescent with overweight and obesity. So there is controversy about BMI, but to date, BMI is associated with obesity. The higher the BMI, the closer that is. It's the best clinical tool we have. And we're looking at it as a screening tool. This gets you into your evaluation. This is not a diagnosis. It allows you to evaluate, continue your evaluation of the child, but it has become a sensitive topic. Pediatricians and other primary care providers should evaluate children two to 18 years of age with overweight and obesity for obesity-related comorbidities. How? By using a comprehensive patient history, mental and behavioral health screening, social determinants of health evaluation, physical exam, and diagnostic studies. So this goes hand in hand with your evaluation of obesity. And then laboratory. So in children 10 years and older, pediatricians and uh, primary care health providers should evaluate for lipid abnormalities, abnormal glucose metabolism, and abnormal liver function in children and adolescents with obesity, and for lipid abnormalities in children and adolescents with overweight. So there is a lab component to this evaluation. And then in children 10 years and older with overweight, pediatricians may evaluate for abnormal glucose metabolism and liver function in the presence of risk factors for type two diabetes or NAFL. And in children two to nine with obesity, pediatricians and other PCPs may evaluate for lipid abnormalities. So you have your sort of lab game plan. And, it, and we should treat obesity and comorbidities concurrently. These are the, just the details about lab evaluations, method, age, and BMI classification. Just a, a few points, uh, the fasting for dyslipidemia, uh, the, the test for dyslipidemia should be fasting. Uh, we, you can evaluate for prediabetes or diabetes using either a fasting plasma glucose, a two-hour plasma glucose after a 75-gram oral glucose tolerance test, or a hemoglobin A1C. Um, NAFLD by obtaining an ALT, just an ALT is okay, and hypertension uh, measuring blood pressure at every visit starting at three, using an appropriate size cup. These are the other comorbidities that we did not have the evidence level to make specific recommendations. So they're consensus recommendations about evaluating them and how you should evaluate them and uh, what you should do. And you see there the more common ones, obstructive sleep apnea, polycystic ovarian disease, depression, blount disease, skiffy, and increased intracranial hypertension. So now on to treatment. Pediatricians and other primary care health providers should treat overweight and obesity in children and adolescents following the principles of the medical home, the chronic care model, using a family-centered, non-stigmatizing approach that acknowledges obesity's biologic, social, and structural drivers. Comprehensive chronic care approach, non-stigmatizing, contextualizing the patient. We, we really looked hard at motivational interviewing and recommend that as one of the primary engagement ret and retention and motivational tools to be used in obesity treatment and um, ask pediatricians to develop skills in motivational interviewing. And you see there Change Talk, which is our free app, which has a virtual avatar. You can practice MI on that. And we have many tools, including um, the uh, 2021 Pediatric Obesity Management course and uh, highlighting um, motivational interviewing. So here is where we begin to talk about intense health behavior and lifestyle treatment. Provider refer six years and older, should, may provide this for children two to five with overweight and obesity. And this health behavior and lifestyle treatment is more effective with greater contact hours. That is not surprising. The most effective treatment in the literature includes 26 or more hours of face-to-face, -face, family-based, multi-component treatment over a three to 12 month period. This is where the research is. It's not to say there weren't studies that use less time and intensity studies. There were one or two studies that used more. The more time and intensity, the better the outcome. You can still get some outcome with less time and intensity, but this is where the evidence centers. What is it? It involves the patient and family and a multidisciplinary team. You provide it on diagnosis. You can do this in a healthcare or community center. What is it? Health education around nutrition, physical activity, sleep, sedentary behavior, media use, skill building, 
in self-management, behavior modification, and counseling. The recommended dosage is three to 12 months long, at least 26 content, content hours. And it can be group, individual, or both. And it can be face-to-face -face and now emerging more virtually. And what are the strategies? These are some core strategies. Now, all these interventions were delivered in clusters of strategies. So we can't disaggregate the, we couldn't disaggregate the strategies and say, do this one thing or do these two strategies. They were all clustered. And the clusters look something like this. Reduction in sugar sweetened beverages, provide nutrition education and counseling, recommending 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity daily, reduction in sedentary time, age appropriate sleep, Okay, so these were the kinds of clusters you found. Um, if you're looking at a kind of intense health and behavioral lifestyle program, it needs to be consistent with evidence-based standards, non-stigmatizing, empathic, and family-centered, developmentally appropriate, consistent with the chronic care model, and values, valuing the partnership in the medical home. Okay, so what do you do when intense health and behavioral lifestyle treatment is not available? You deliver the best treatment you can at the time to all children with overweight and obesity. We know we're building this as we go. We, and you continue to build capacity as you go. It's not the answer anybody wants, but it's the, the situation we're in. So what does this look like? It looks like a ramp. It looks like knowing where you start. Where are you? We have a capacity assessment in our implementation materials that literally asks you, does your staff know the guidelines? Are you... Uh, are you screening for social determinants of health? You know where you are, you start there. And you assess your capacity, what are you doing? What do you need to do? And you build it like a ramp. And you can see that there. That's the situation we're in to provide this treatment. And we have many pediatricians doing just that. We have a number of quality improvement projects we're currently running for evaluation, assessment, and treatment. And pediatricians are doing this very well. And they're just building these processes in their clinic. If you wanna know about um, intense health and behavioral lifestyle programs on our website, shows you how to find the best program, where they are, what they are, what are recommended. And the CDC has recommended five or six of these that are, are ready to go, uh, they're ready to go nationally, and uh, you can access them through this website. What about pharmacotherapy? Okay, pediatricians and other primary healthcare professionals should offer adolescents 12 and older with obesity, Pharmacotherapy according to medication indications, risks, and benefits as an adjunct to health, behavioral, and lifestyle treatment. You may offer this to children 8 through 11. No current evidence supports weight loss medication use as a monotherapy. Pediatricians and primary care health providers who prescribe weight loss medication should provide or refer to intense behavioral interventions for patients and families. What do we do? Same as we always do. We have to know the patient selection criteria, the medication efficacy, adverse effects, follow-up and monitoring guidelines. If you're using injectables, how that's going to work in your office. And we'll talk, I, we will take, I'm sure, some questions on this. And we follow the 2019 uh, me metabolic and bariatric surgery guidelines, uh, should offer and refer for adolescents 13 years and older with severe obesity that meet the criteria of a BMI over the 125th, 120th percentile, the 95th percentile for age and sex. For evaluation, you are not assigning them surgery. You're referring them to be evaluated by a surgical program. And this is the criteria that we have in place for those patients. Um, if you're looking for a comprehensive multidisciplinary obesity treatment program, this is our website. We have a, a list of where they are and who might be close to you. Now, putting it all together, you saw this grid, you have your armamentarium of motivational interviewing, intense health behavior and lifestyle treatment, pharmacotherapy and surgery, and you're serving as a medical home, trying to tailor treatment using the resources of the that the family and patient have access to in your practice and in the community, and you're providing ongoing medical evaluation and monitoring. This is sort of your, the cheat sheet about all the roles that, all the things that have to be done. I'm just giving you sort of a check down list. And this is our capacity assessment. And I encourage all of you, if you're thinking of doing this, to do this capacity assessment, it will both reassure you and then show you where you have work yet to do. Some of these systems you may already have in place. Some might be low hanging fruit. 
Some you may have to work on a little harder, but you can sort of uh, localize your work around this. And then we do have some advocacy recommendations. Although this was, <laughs> they don't wanna do advocacy either apparently. Um, this was not an advocacy document, but we want coverage. We understand this very well to advocate for that. We know we need partnerships across uh, multi-sectors, uh, across communities, specialties, medical homes to get this done. Um, we know we need clinical decision support. We want improved education and training for all of us and our, and our residents and students. And we, want we need policy change. Um, we will be having a prevention statement come out shortly from the Academy, which will also cover uh, prevention-oriented recommendations and advocacy. Um, we know there's some limitation, lot, limitations here. We have uncertainty, evidence gaps, and future research needs. Um, we need outcome measures in addition to BMI and primary care. Uh, be it, what happens with uh, comorbidity change in BMI, BMI and comorbidity change. We need more research on duration of treatment effects on weight and comorbidities and the heterogeneity of treatment effects. Obesity is a very heterogeneous disease and responds in that way to treatment. We need specific research on social determinants on special populations and the impact of specific components and multi-component programs and the impact of new anti-obesity medications. Um, we need cultural adaptations. Uh, we have a program where you can access uh, EHR support through the academy and get this into your EHR. Uh, we need more of that. We need linkages between community and clinic. How to reduce attrition, cost and sustainability, and adapt adapting programs to delivery settings. So the key takeaways here from the guidelines uh, and I'm going to leave time for questions, is obesity is a complex chronic disease. It is important to evaluate the whole child. This is a whole child approach. We didn't expand upon that, but this is, this is a, a child in front of you, not a disease, a child. So you wanna understand the complexity of the disease, but also understand the child, the context in their family, in their community, what they're, what they're all about, what the family can do. This is a whole child approach. Uh, obesity treatment is safe and effective and there are strategies for treatment. We have to treat the comorbidities concurrently and we should offer treatment upon diagnosis. And I'll just point you to, we have many, many, many implementation resources and we're just gonna quickly go through um, them here. I hope you get the slide deck because you have them here. We have, uh, podcasts about all the components of uh, obesity therapy. We have podcasts about the CB CPG uh, in detail. We have uh, quality improvement programs, clinical su uh, decision support tools, uh, family resources, and uh, a host of things I hope you'll find on our website. So let me um, just show you, this is a, uh, just a tool for uh, quality improvement programs. And this is our, our, our website and resources. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you and go on if there are any questions. And thank you very much for your attention.